This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, wow. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, in case you came to the wrong room. Uh, I'm David Wickle. This is my exit seminar. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about some of the comparative genomics that I've done in seed free plants over the last few years. Uh, so first, why study seed free plants? Uh, despite the fact that they're sometimes easily overlooked uh, in the shadow of the dominant or angiosperm dominated flora, uh, seed free plants, especially ferns and lycophytes are really cool. Uh, they're incredibly diverse in form. They inhabit a diverse array of habitats uh, and serve as important members of the ecosystems where they're found. Uh, as their name implies, they don't use seeds. Instead, they reproduce via spores, uh, which can create these independent haploid gametophytes that then go on to release sperm uh, that fertilize eggs, producing sporophytes, starting the whole cycle over again. Uh, they're also evolutionarily important. Uh, so ferns are the sister lineage to all seed plants, and lycophytes are sister to all other vascular plants. They've retained lots of important ancestral traits, uh, things like vasculature and sporophyte branching, uh, and have also independently evolved key features like roots and leaves. Uh, and this is really important, right, for making comparisons uh, that can help give us an idea about the hidden processes that guide evolution. Uh, so I've talked about why seed-free plants. But why genomics? Uh, the last 10 years have been a real renaissance for genomic research. Uh, there's been a surge in the number of assemblies published, uh, as you can see over the years on this y-axis, and also in the quality of those assemblies, or sorry, x-axis, as shown on the y-axis here. Uh, despite this surge in genome assemblies, right, uh, there are a lot of orders that are still poorly represented. And, and that's because genomics tends to focus on species that are economically important, or that have small genomes. Uh, and unfortunately, those kind of plants are in the minority among ferns and lycophytes. Uh, so there are lots of orders of ferns uh, for which there are no genome assemblies. And as of when I started this PhD, uh, a couple orders of lycophytes that also did not have any genome assemblies. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about my research in uh, comparative genomics. Uh, I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about whole genome duplication uh, using a couple of our genome assemblies as case studies. Uh, then I'm gonna talk to you about Isoides taiwanensis and change gears a little bit to talk about CAM photosynthesis uh, and the convergent evolution of CAM in this aquatic lineage. Uh, and then I'm gonna finish up talking about my latest research uh, looking into the recurrent formation of allopolyploids uh, in the Isoides Appalachiana complex. So let's get started with whole genome duplication. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit more about genomics of seed free plants. And specifically, I want to talk about the difference between heterosporous lineages versus homosporous lineages. Uh, so, briefly, heterosporous lineages, which include all seed plants, all flowering plants, um, produce two different types of spores uh, that then go on to produce two different types of gametophytes, one of which produces sperm and one of which produces an egg. Uh, homosporous lineages, on the other hand, produce a single a uh, hermaphroditic gametophyte capable of producing both sperm and egg. And this distinction is important for genomics uh, primarily because homosporous lineages tend to have much larger uh, genomes characterized by much more numerous chromosomes. Uh, so in the ferns, the vast majority of lineages are homosporous, uh, the one exception being the order Salviniales, uh, the water ferns, which are heterosporous. Uh, within lycophytes, the majority of species are heterosporous, but the earliest diverging lineage, uh, Lycopodiales, is entirely homosporous. Uh, so like I was talking about earlier, right, homosporous plants tend to have much larger genomes, much more chromosomes. An extreme example is shown over here in Ophioglossum reticulatum, uh, which has a chromosome count of over 1,200 chromosomes. Uh, if we compare this to a heterosporous angiosperm, the grass Panicum virginiatum, uh, which I believe is actually a, a tetraploid, uh, it only has 36 chromosomes. This is an extreme example, but it's a pattern that's borne out across all vascular plants, uh, where we see that homosporous lineages on average have three to four times the number of chromosomes as their related heterosporous lineages. So I'm gonna explain uh, whole genome duplication briefly, right? That's what this section is about. Um, whole genome duplication is very common among all vascular plants, uh, particularly ferns and lycophytes. 
And essentially it consists of, of just the duplication of all the chromosomes in, inside of a plant. Uh, this is fascinating to me because I feel like, you know, I was taught that evolution was this sort of gradual process, right? Where one mutation builds on another over enormous periods of time. But whole genome duplication suddenly and rapidly changes the entire genome of a plant, uh, resulting in usually immediate genetic isolation from its parental lineages, and also in drastic changes to its phenotype, uh, while providing the raw material for evolution, right, in the form of, of more genes, uh, more chromosomal material. But if this were the end of the story, right, we would expect to see plant lineages, heterosporous and homosporous, characterized by large numbers of chromosomes, uh, by multisomic inheritance, by, by polyploid expression of genes, and we don't see that. Instead, even in lineages like, say, Arabidopsis, with a known history of whole genome duplication, we see relatively small genomes uh, with diploid expression and disomic inheritance, and that's because of this process of diploidization. Uh, so diploidization is the process by which we go from this state, right, through the polyploid state and back to something resembling a diploid. And this happens through chromosomal rearrangements uh, that restore pairing of chromosomes at meiosis, uh, and also through large-scale loss of genes and chromosomal material, uh, typically through illegitimate recombination, uh, that can lead to a variety of outcomes, right, that further serves to isolate these lineages from one another, uh, as well as the ones that gave rise to them. So because of this process of diploidization, it can be difficult to detect whole genome duplications that happened far back in time, in evolutionary time. Uh, so we do that by a few different methods. Uh, the first one is KS. And KS functions on the principle that when a gene is duplicated, uh, the two duplicates are identical. As they diverge, we can plot that divergence along the x-axis. So if we compare many genes right, within a genome, uh, what we expect to see, if there's no history of whole genome duplication, is, is what we see down here in the bottom corner in Selaginella, a sort of exponential decrease uh, in the number of genes and, uh, that have higher KS values, right? And this is a result of, of fractionation, genes being lost over time as they diverge in sequence. But in the case of a whole genome duplication, we expect to see these peaks. And those peaks represent a cohort of genes that were all duplicated at the same time and then are diverging at relatively the same rate. So this is the first evidence that we can use to identify whole genome duplications. The second is phylogenetic reconciliation. In phylogenetic reconciliation, we take many gene trees um, from many species, and then we compare them to a known species tree. And what we look for in those gene trees are branches or clades that are duplicated over and over and over again in multiple gene trees, as represented by this line here, right? The percentage of times we see these nodes duplicated. And if we see nodes that are duplicated far more than others, we can infer that maybe a duplication happened there. And the important thing about phylogenetic reconciliation is it doesn't simply tell us if duplications occurred. It can tell us when they occurred and place them into this evolutionary context. The final way that we identify ancient whole genome duplications and arguably sort of the gold standard uh, is syntony. So with syntony, right, this operates on the concept that when a chromosome is duplicated, an entire chromosome, all the genes along that chromosome start out in the same order. Over time, through diploidization, those genes can be shuffled around, those genes can be lost, but still, for millions or tens of millions of years, blocks of genes that are collinear or syntenic exist, and we can detect those. And those are evidence that at some point in the past, uh, there was a large-scale duplication, right, of entire chromosomes. Uh, so these plots here actually show syntony between two different species. Uh, so you can do syntony either within a species, right? And if you see syntenic blocks, you expect that there was a duplication, or you can compare them between species. And for instance, if you see a duplication in species A, but not in species B, uh, you would expect each block in species B, here represented by dots, or here represented by lines, uh, to be represented twice in species A. So syntony, similar to phylogenetic reconciliation, can give us an idea of which duplications are, are shared uh, between different lineages. All right, now that we're all experts in detecting whole genome duplication, I'm going to talk about the first genome today, uh, and that's that of Alsophila spinulosa. Uh, this assembly was produced in collaboration uh, with researchers at the Chinese Academy of Forestry. And uh, I have some assembly stats up there, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Instead, we're going to stick to WGD. Um, even in the best of scenarios, when you have all of the possible evidence available to you, uh, detecting whole genome duplications can be relatively straightforward. 
but figuring out how many happened and when they occurred uh, is often not. And that's demonstrated by this phylogeny here, where I have plotted uh, the results of four different studies over the last four years that looked at whole genome duplication in the Cyathiales, uh, or the tree ferns, right, the group to which this fern belongs. Every single one found different conclusions represented by these circles on the phylogeny. So each of these uh, is a whole genome duplication, right, inferred by a different study. Um, I want to draw your attention briefly to these with the asterisk. Different studies use different species in their sampling. Uh, and in these two cases, they only included a single species from the Cyathiaceae. So it's possible, had they had better sampling and included more species from that group, uh, that they would have inferred a duplication at the same place that we did. Um, by the way, ours are on here in yellow, but you'll see them again later. Uh, so we did the usual battery of tests, right, that I just talked about. Uh, phylogenetic reconciliation identified two duplications, one before the divergence of Cyathiaceae, another before the divergence of the Cyathiales. Uh, this was largely recapitulated by KS. Uh, within the Cyathiaceae, we can see two peaks represented here in blue and orange. Um, in the Cyathiales, a little harder to see because it's a very old duplication, uh, but we can see a single peak more diffuse uh, further out uh, from the y-axis. But what was really exciting about this particular analysis uh, was the syntony. So as I said earlier, right, uh, syntony is, is lost as species diploidize and becomes less and less informative. So generally over scales of millions or tens of millions of years, uh, it becomes harder and harder to detect. Our most recent whole genome duplication that we identified in this group happened over 100 million years ago. And yet despite that, we see this incredible amount of syntony uh, with each one of these lines representing a syntenic gene pair. And more than that, uh, this one's not organized particularly well to show that, but we see an almost one-to-one -one relationship between the various chromosomes here, uh, showing that there's been very little chromosomal rearrangement since this whole genome duplication 100 million years ago. Uh, this is unheard of in vascular plants. Uh, there are some cases in mosses uh, and also in fish where intergenomic syntony, that is between two genomes, has been preserved for 100 million years or 150 million years. Um, this is the only case I know of in vascular plants and the only case I know of where this intragenomic syntony following a whole genome duplication is so well preserved. That being said, our Hemosporus fern genome assembly was not the only one that year. Um, and so while I would like right, to extrapolate my result to all Hemosporus plants, or at least all Hemosporus ferns, uh, there are two problems with that. And they're Ceratopterus richardii and Adiantum capillus veneris. Both of these ferns have experienced whole genome duplications more recently than Alsophila spinulosa. And yet, when we look at the syntony within their genomes, we don't see the same thing at all. Uh, there are relatively few gene pairs preserved. Um, these ferns just came out, these assemblies. So I don't have a great explanation for this yet. But suffice to say that the things that are, that are regulating the number of chromosomes, right, that are driving up the number of chromosomes in these mosporous ferns are not as simple as reduced recombination or or less rearrangement during diploidization. So, like I said earlier, there are not just Hemosporus ferns, there are also Hemosporus lycophytes. And we had the opportunity to collaborate uh, with researchers at JGI and also the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Science uh, to do not one, but two genome assemblies uh, in this group, the Lycopodiaceae. Uh, you might notice I said two genome assemblies, but since we're all experts at WGD now, uh, you recognize these as syntony plots, and I have three. Uh, and that's because Lepertia asiatica is a recent allopolyploid, uh, allotetraploid. And our collaborators at the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Science were able to separate those two subgenomes so that we could perform analyses on them uh, separately, which was very interesting for our whole genome duplication analysis, uh, but also much more computationally efficient. Uh, Lepertia asiatica has over 100 chromosomes. So again, usual battery of tests, right? Here are our KS plots. Uh, we see single peaks in both of them. And then these vertical lines that weren't in the other ones just represent the divergence either between uh, Hupertia asiatica and Diphasiastrum complanatum, our two species here uh, shown in green, or each of them and their closest heterosporous relative in isoetes. Uh, the problem with KS in this group is that substitution rates are very slow. As a result, if you have multiple whole genome duplications, these KS peaks can tend to stack up on one another, uh, making it very difficult to discern whether this peak represents one or multiple duplications. 
Uh, so to get more insight, right, we turned to our phylogenetic reconciliation. And what we find in diphasiastrum is in fact a single duplication. Uh, but in Hupertia asiatica, we find two, one prior to the divergence of the two subgenomes and another prior to the divergence of the entire genus Hupertia. But again, what was exciting here was not that we identified whole genome duplications. Um, Lycopodiaceae is rife with whole genome duplication. Yet another thing that made placing them using KS particularly frustrating. Uh, what was exciting was the syntony. So we have our phylogeny here, right, with whole genome duplications marked on it. Um, and here we have intergenomic syntony plots. So these are not within a single genome, they're between two. The first one shows syntony between the two subgenomes of Hupertia asiatica. These species has emerged 33 million years ago, which is certainly not too long for syntony to be preserved. But if you look at the representation of syntony between these two, so each of these black dots is not just a gene pair, that's a block of collinear genes. Uh, you see that it's almost perfectly preserved across both of these genomes. They're almost identical in gene order, uh, which is incredible after 33 million years. But what's really incredible is when we compare these two species. Uh, so Hupertia asiatica and Diphasiastrum complanatum are as divergent as two Lycopodiaceae species can be, uh, with our best guess putting them at about 400 million years diverged. Uh, they've both experienced independent whole genome duplications in that time. And despite that, we see large proportions of the genome represented in our synthony plot. And not only that, we can also identify a two to four relationship between the chromosomes. Uh, that recapitulates our finding from the phylogenetic analysis that we have one duplication in diphasiastrum uh, for two in Hupertia asia or Hupertia asiatica. Uh, so, if our uh, findings in Alsophila were impressive, uh, this is mind blowing. I mean, you know, forget about moss, forget about fish. Uh, there, there are no other examples of syntony being preserved over these kind of time periods. Uh, so again, right, it points to this fact that at least in some homosporous lineages, uh, the rearrangement of chromosomes following duplication uh, or even following speciation is occurring at a very slow rate. Speaking of rates, uh, before I move on, I briefly want to talk about substitution rates in these two groups uh, because it's another thing that unites them. So Cyathiales have previously been shown to have low substitution rates uh, using chloroplast data compared to other firms. Uh, and our study used nuclear data, right, for both of these, genomic data, and found that they had lower substitution rates in the Lycopodiaceae relative to all of our heterosporous lycophytes, um, and in Cyathiales relative to all other ferns, homosporous and heterosporous. Now, while I don't think that this is directly linked, that is to say causative, right, uh, with, with our reduced rates of rearrangement, it's another interesting correlation that we have between these two groups uh, compared to other heterosporous lineages and even other homosporous lineages of ferns. All right, on to my favorite plants. Uh, we're going to talk about isoedes for a little while, and we're going to shift gears, uh, not talk about whole genome duplication, uh, and talk a little bit about CAM photosynthesis instead. Uh, isoedes are just an incredible group of plants. Uh, they're very diminutive, right? Easy to overlook. Uh, but they're thought to be the closest living relatives of these giant tree-like plants that used to dominate the Carboniferous flora, and in fact make up the majority of the coal that we burn today. Uh, despite being, again, much smaller than their relatives, uh, they have a worldwide distribution, they're very diverse, they occupy a wide range of both aquatic and terrestrial habitats, um, and, and they're part of a long unbranching lineage, right, that diverged from all other vascular plants uh, over 350 million years ago. So we sequenced the Isoides taiwanensis genome. This was actually the first genomic analysis I did when I got to Cornell, uh, but I'm really not going to spend any time talking about it. Uh, this will come up again later. We did do our whole genome duplication analysis, and while synthony was not particularly informative in this group, uh, we did find evidence for one duplication uh, in its history from a combination of KS and phylogenetic reconciliation. But what's really neat about Isoedes uh, is that it does CAM photosynthesis. And if you've heard about CAM before, it has almost certainly been in the context of dry adapted plants like this cactus or this agave uh, that do it to conserve water, right? So essentially, uh, in dry adapted plants, 
CAM allows them to close their stomata during the hottest part of the day to reduce transpiration to the environment. They then open their stomata at night, take up carbon dioxide, uh, fix that carbon dioxide and store it as malate, and then it's released during the day to conduct photosynthesis while the stomata are closed. Isoetes does CAM photosynthesis when it's completely submerged. Uh, so it's clearly not doing this to conserve water. Why is it doing CAM? Uh, we got some interesting information on this from my colleague Jacob Suisa, who published a paper uh, where they did CO2 starvation experiments that show that Isoetes is doing CAM most likely because of the limited availability of CO2 in the water. Carbon dioxide diffuses through water very poorly, and during the day it's used up very quickly by algae and other aquatic plants in the water column. So as an adaptation to this, Isoetes absorbs as much CO2 as it can at night, uh, through its roots, in fact. And then during the day, right, it releases the malate from the vacuole, it liberates the CO2 and fixes that carbon into sugar. Uh, and one of the first things we found when we compared gene expression in Isoetes to these terrestrial plants, uh, not these terrestrial plants, but pineapple, kalanchoe, and sedum, uh, is that gene expression, both the genes that are differentially expressed and the manner in which they're expressed is very similar, uh, almost identical in many cases. And this was interesting, if for no other reason, because there's actually been some pushback in calling this CAM, right? CAM is an adaptation to dry environments. Uh, and, and so this really shows that at least from a genetic perspective, there's really no difference between what these plants are doing and what these plants are doing. Uh, there were some differences between aquatic plants and terrestrial plants. Again, for the sake of time, I'm really just going to focus on the one that I think is the coolest. Uh, so this is Pepsi. Well, this is Pepsi too, but Pepsi is the enzyme that carboxylates or that does the first carboxylation reaction uh, in the CAM pathway. Pepsi is, is a pretty diverse gene family. Uh, it can be broadly divided into two groups. There's plant type Pepsi. Uh, and this is the one that most people talk about in reference to CAM. It's the one that's generally been co-opted uh, for that first carboxylation step. And then there's bacterial type Pepsi, which is a little bit more obscure, uh, often lowly expressed, if at all, in photosynthetic tissues. So imagine my surprise when uh, I looked at which copy was expressed in Isoetes, and first of all, found not one, but two copies that were highly expressed, and then found that the most highly expressed was actually this bacterial type Pepsi. So there is one place, right, where bacterial type Pepsi is known to be highly expressed, and that's in the developing seeds of the castor oil plant. Uh, and there, it's found to form a heterooctomer with plant type Pepsi, and is found to be much less sensitive to inhibition by malate, which accumulates in large quantities in these castor oil seeds as they're developing. There's another place we know of, right, where malate accumulates in large quantities, and that's in the leaves of these CAM plants. So while I have no evidence to support this, um, I think it's a really exciting story, right? And, and something that certainly merits following up on, uh, that it's very possible that Isoetes that expresses both of these copies of Pepsi, right, with relatively uh, similar expression patterns in the leaves, uh, might also do this as an adaptation to the increased amount in malate, of malate in the leaves, uh, allowing them to fix a little bit more CO2 at night uh, and be inhibited a little less. All right, on to my last chapter, still Isoetes, uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about the recurrent formation of allopolyploid lineages in Isoetes Appalachiana. So while CAM is really cool, it is not actually the first thing that attracted me to Isoetes. Uh, Isoetes is known for its really high propensity to form hybrids and also polyploids. Um, in fact, researchers have found if you put basically any two diploid species of Isoetes together, they will form hybrids. Uh, the problem is, is those diploid hybrids are sterile, basically across the board. Um, that being said, they can duplicate their entire genome, right? Whole genome duplication, which restores fertility, allowing them to form these really prolific uh, populations, like these two of Isoetes Appalachiana, a polyploid that we're going to get to know in just a minute. So this depicts the reticulate relationships uh, between Isoetes inglemania, there's the hybrid relationships, uh, one species, one North American species and a few other species in North America. And as you can see, it's, it's wild. All of these species in green are various hybrids and the polyploid hybrids are represented by shapes uh, with different numbers of sides, right? Six sides is hexaploid, three sides is triploid, et cetera. Uh, and this proclivity, right, for hybridization and polyploidization makes this a great system to study the recurrent formation of polyploids. Uh, 
One last thing before I talk about Icewides Appalachiana uh, is throughout the study of polyploids, throughout the history of the study of polyploids, various people have referred to them as dead ends. Um, most recently, in 2011 and 2012, a series of papers came out that identified uh, lower diversification rates and higher rates of extinction in polyploids. And this also sort of makes sense based on what we see in Isoedes, right? I said that this would come back later. We find evidence for one whole genome duplication uh, in this whole history of Isoedes. And mind you, we could have more sampling, right? If we had more species, we might find more along other branches. Um, but this doesn't really work, right, with what we know about the fact that, uh, in fact, more than half or around half of the species in Isoedes are polyploid. Uh, so why are there so many polyploids now, but so few, relatively few in the evolutionary record? Uh, and it comes back to this idea that perhaps polyploids form all the time, right, uh, but don't actually live that long. And if that, that's the case, it has important implications, not just for evolution, uh, but also for conservation. Many polyploids are rare. Uh, in fact, a lot of them are even federally listed species, right? But if they don't live that long, uh, if they don't uh, say, you know, admix with other populations, if they're relatively isolated and short-lived, uh, maybe that effort would be better spent on the diploid species. So to answer this uh, and some other basic questions sort of about polyploid speciation in Isoedes, I turned to this group, Isoedes Appalachiana. I picked it for a couple of reasons. Uh, it has a very large distribution. Its parentage is already known. Uh, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of this poster that Peter made, like, I don't know how many years ago. Uh, but uh, postdoc in our lab, Peter, it previously found that it's the, the product of, of at least two separate hybridization events uh, between Isoedes ingomanii and Isoedes valida. Uh, this was done, though, with low copy nuclear genes. I wanted to leverage uh, RADSeq, next gen sequencing, uh, whole genome skimming to take a more in-depth look uh, using more populations at how frequently these lineages form, uh, whether or not lineages can form uh, with either diploid parent as the maternal parent, and whether or not we see any evidence of gene flow uh, within these species. Uh, so I once again got to do a lot of field work. Uh, I conduct field work all the way from upstate New York down to Northern Georgia. Uh, on this map, tetraploids I collected are represented by green squares. Uh, Inglemanii is represented by blue circles, and Isoides valida is represented by yellow circles. Uh, those are colors I'll try to stick to for the next few slides, though I think there's at least one exception. Um, and finding Isoides in the field is sort of like playing Where's Waldo uh, in a sea of Waldos. So there are like five or six different plant species in this little clump in this lake. One of them is Isoides. Uh, feel free to tell me which one. <laughs> Uh, so I collected lots of plants. Uh, I sent them off for DD rad seek, which basically consisted of me just weighing plant material into a plastic tube. Uh, but I also did genome skimming for which I got to do a little bit of wet lab, uh, some DNA extraction and library prep, uh, for which I was awarded a, a graduate fellowship at the Smithsonian. Uh, I worked with Liz Zimmer and did all of this wet lab under the expert guidance of her tech, uh, Gabe Johnson, uh, and as a wonderful and enjoyable experience. Uh, great to finally do some wet lab. But before I could do anything with that data, I had some work to do. Uh, working with allopolyploids is difficult because essentially you're looking at a genome that contains two divergent genomes with different evolutionary histories, uh, which makes things like phylogenetic and population genetic analysis difficult. Uh, so I used a somewhat unorthodox approach uh, that I adapted from a Bomberly et al. paper on soybean, uh, creating a pseudo reference using my diploid rad seq data. I did that by mapping it first to a reference assembly from Isoedes ingomanii. I pulled out regions where both diploid parents mapped, and then I took those mapped reads uh, and created my pseudo reference assembly. Then I took that pseudo reference assembly and mapped my polyploid reads to it. And reads that mapped differentially to one parent or the other were then retained for downstream analysis and treated basically as separate diploid populations. The first analysis I did was a principal components analysis, and this was basically just to make sure that my phasing approach sort of worked, uh, and it appears to have. So we see that uh, the Appalachian loci in green and yellow tend to cluster uh, with their diploid parent like I would expect them to. Uh, so following this, I also constructed a phylogeny to look for evidence of recurrent formation of these lineages. Uh, and basically, you know, I'm just doing this by counting monophyletic clades 
of Isoides Appalachiana that are separated from their diploid relatives. And looking at this tree, we can easily infer uh, four different formation events that led to the current distribution of Isoides Appalachiana. Uh, sorry, I meant to mark these with asterisks or something. It's a little hard to look at, I acknowledge. Uh, surprisingly, despite this recurrent formation of Isoides Appalachiana, in every single case uh, from our chloroplast tree, right, we see that Isoides Inglemanii is the maternal pair. Uh, and I say this is surprising because there is evidence that at least between species of equal ploidy, uh, that either parent is equally likely uh, to be the maternal versus paternal parent. Uh, that being said, in species of differing ploidy, uh, differences in sizes of the sperm means that polyploid sperm cannot fit through the archegonial neck cells of the diploid. So in crosses between polyploids and diploids, we basically always see that the polyploid is the maternal parent. Uh, while these are both diploids, it's possible that there are differences, right, in the anatomy of these archegonial neck cells or in the size of their sperm. Uh, similarly, another study found that the formation of these archegonia can vary widely between species. Unfortunately, the study did not include Isoides valida, uh, but it did find that Isoides inglemanii is particularly prolific uh, and good at forming these archegonia. So it's possible, right, that Isoides inglemanii just forms a lot more archegonia than Isoides valida. So I'm less likely to sample polyploids uh, that were formed in the opposite direction. Another sort of surprising result uh, is that we found no evidence for isolation by distance. And what I mean by this is that as populations get more geographically distant, they do not tend to also get more genetically distant. Uh, <clears throat> and this is counterintuitive at first, uh, because we expect isoides to be very dispersal limited, right? It can only disperse passively through the water or occasionally uh, maybe conduct long distance dispersal on migrating waterfowl. Uh, but I, I honestly expected there to be quite a bit of structure here. Um, I have an explanation for this though, and I think it's a relatively simple one. Uh, I think that for something like isoides that is so dispersal limited, one mile is basically as good as 100. Uh, it's as likely to disperse to that pond one county over uh, as it is to, you know, ride on a goose uh, two states over. And as a result, we see this pretty flat distribution uh, where we have very distant populations that are relatively similar, uh, but also populations that are very close together that are very distant. All right, the last analysis I'm going to talk about today uh, is my admixture analysis. And this is to look for evidence of gene flow within these uh, species of isoides, either between the diploids, or sorry, within the diploids, within the polyploids, or possibly between them. Um, so this first plot is called an admixture plot. And without going into too much detail, because I think oh, not that low on time, um, without going into too much detail, essentially you, you assign it a fixed number of populations, in this case, nine. Uh, in this case, you arrive at that number using something called a cross entropy plot. But you can also use like biologically informative numbers, right? If you sampled from 20 populations, say, you could try to assign these to 20 ancestral populations. Um, in this case, we went with the one that was identified by cross entropy, which was nine. And what it does is it tries to assign each of these individuals to an ancestral population, um, but can also assign a single individual to multiple ancestral populations, right? Which we might infer as evidence of admixture, either in the past or ongoing. We can see that in Isoides and Glomanii, almost all of these blocks are a solid color. Uh, there are kind of these multicolored tails at the bottoms of them, uh, but those are mostly associated with missing data. Uh, as missing data increases, those little rainbow tails on the ends of them get longer. Um, we do see at least one instance from admixture uh, plots that appears to show gene flow between these individuals in DW86 and 111 and uh, these polyploid individuals at the end. Uh, the issue with this is that these are diploids and these are polyploids. So I don't expect this to be evidence of ongoing gene flow. Um, instead, what I interpret this as is historic gene flow between the diploid progenitors of those polyploids and perhaps the diploid ancestors of these diploids. The other analysis that we used, one of the other analyses that we used, again, I'm not talking about it all today, um, are, are these reticulate phylogenies uh, made in a program called Splits Tree. And we make these because while all the trees I've shown you today have been these sort of branching bifurcating trees, that's not really how evolution works, right? Particularly within species, uh, we expect there to be lots of gene flow between different populations. Uh, we expect these things to be able to reproduce with one another. And as a result, 
those branches on that neatly bifurcating tree would have lines drawn between them, right? Showing evidence of that gene flow. And that's all this is. Um, so here we do see, right? These diploid individuals kind of come out on a branch and might show some reticulation with those polyploids. Uh, but another thing that we see is these, despite not showing any evidence of admixture in our bar plot, uh, these individuals here, which are all polyploids from central Pennsylvania and Northern Maryland, uh, show a high degree of admixture. And I'm pointing that out because it's also something uh, that we're going to see on future plots. Uh, one last thing I want to mention before I move on uh, are these large blocks of color we see. So these large blocks of color actually comprise multiple sites that I sampled, uh, some of which span multiple watersheds. So while once again, this could be evidence of ongoing admixture between these populations, the distances are large enough uh, that I would also argue this could just be example of recent dispersal of a single uh, ancestral population, right? So this could just represent multiple dispersal events um, of a single population as opposed to ongoing gene flow. So this is the same analysis shown for Isoides valida, uh, has even more taxa, so even harder to read. But uh, if you just look at the colors, uh, we see a lot more evidence of, of admixture. It's still very limited, right? For the most part, this is still a plot dominated by large single blocks of color. Um, and, and each of these blocks typically represents a single site or a single watershed. Um, but we have a few exceptions. Uh, first of all, we still see these polyploid uh, accessions from central Pennsylvania and northern Maryland clustering together. Uh, again, I can't say definitively whether or not there is admixture going on just from this data, uh, but it seems like the most likely example of, of gene flow between polyploid populations. Uh, but we do see one really excellent example of gene flow uh, between two diploid populations. Uh, so this involves these samples DW90. These are from um, the Cheat River in West Virginia. And I sampled six individuals from this population. Uh, two of them come out in this large group uh, that, again, does span multiple watersheds. Two of them come out in this very small group uh, with another site uh, from a, a river located, sorry, a creek located nearby. And then two of them uh, show a mixed ancestry between the two, almost perfectly mixed 50 50. Uh, so I would argue, right, that this is really good evidence of, of one instance where we see active admixture and gene flow going on uh, between two different populations in the Cheat River. All right, this is my only big long text slide in here. Um, in conclusion, uh, we see that polyploids form very frequently right in this group. Uh, despite that, we don't see any evidence of reciprocal formation. Um, Isoides appears to be severely limited by dispersal, but just based on those admixture plots, right, we see that there is evidence of some kind of long range dispersal, at least infrequently. Uh, despite that capacity for long range dispersal, admixture seems rare. Uh, we don't have any really concrete cases where we can absolutely say, right, that this is an example of ongoing admixture between these populations, uh, except for that one example from Isoides valida. So what does this all mean, right? Going back to what I said earlier about conservation, um, it seems to support this idea that despite polyploids forming very frequently, uh, we see them being successful pretty rarely. And if that's true, I think that this, right, the fact that they form frequently, that these polyploids are important members of the ecosystems where they're found, uh, suggests a diploid first approach, by which I don't mean we should forget about the polyploids. I mean that preserving the processes that recurrently generate the polyploids is more important than preserving one population or another per se. Uh, and that by conserving those processes, right, we increase the chance that some polyploid lineages might eventually be successful. Um, that if those polyploid lineages serve an important role in their community, that they'll continue to exist uh, without perhaps wasting resources focusing on, on small or, or narrowly distributed polyploid lineages. <coughs> that I have a lot of people to acknowledge. Uh, first of all, my collaborators, both at the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Science, uh, at the Chinese Academy of Forestry, uh, JGI and the Salk Institute for all of their help uh, assembling these genomes and with the downstream analyses we did. Uh, everybody at BTI and the Lee Lab uh, who's helped out a lot uh, the people at the Smithsonian for teaching me how to do wet lab, uh, 
Uh, Jacob for letting me just drop into his office basically any time and ask him ridiculous questions about bioinformatics. Um, the other Jacob for letting me ask him ridiculous questions about <laughs> Isoetes, Peter too. Uh, and there are a lot of other people I need to thank. Uh, acknowledgements isn't even a strong enough word, so I made another slide. Um, I cannot thank Layla enough. She's put up with so much. Uh, she's listened to us ramble about plant evolution nonstop. She's put up with me being stressed and late nights and early mornings, and I'm so grateful and couldn't have done any of this without her. Uh, my family, I literally would not be here without them. Uh, they came all the way here from Kansas to see me give this presentation. Also, Layla's family, who came all the way from Pinsakin, despite probably understanding very little of this. <laughs> very kind of you. Uh, and all the lovely people that I've met since coming to Ithaca, uh, you supported me through a pandemic. Uh, you got me through a dissertation. I couldn't be more grateful. Uh, thank you so much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Sorry. <laughs> Excellent talk, David. Uh, um, I had a quick question at the end on conservation. When it comes to plants like just doubling their genomes, do they, can you tell from the outside very easily in terms of like if, if you took a behaviorist approach? In terms of them fitting into this larger like ecological niche, do the diploids just do the same stuff? That's a great question, and one that I actually uh, had intended to address more directly with this. Uh, this project kind of got pushed off and off and off because of the pandemic. Um, but absolutely, I, I think an important component of this analysis that I didn't do is is looking at uh, the niches that the polyploids occupy versus the diploids. Uh, in other species, right, there's evidence that diploids really are just filling in space left behind, uh, sorry, polypoids are just filling in space left behind by the diploids. Um, but there are also other studies that show that polypoids are capable of kind of inhabiting these new environments, right? Uh, spreading to higher elevations or higher latitudes, uh, in which case they would be important. Uh, as far as if you can just, you know, tell them apart generally, in isoetes, <laughs> not really. Uh, in other plants, to varying degrees, uh, right? So most of what I'm talking about here is allopolyploidy, which also involves hybridization. Um, and those hybrids can be easier to determine from their polyploid relatives uh, than the other case, which is just duplication uh, of a single genome or autopolyploidy. Um, but yeah, I think that's an important part of, of this project that I would like to do eventually. Uh, and, and I think would give us a lot more insight into the conservation implications of preserving one or the other. Okay, and I have another question. Go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> when it, when it, so many humans like try so many of their diseases, um, most of the time, plants apparently they plants are wild. double their genome and not don't care. explode. Yeah. Um, <laughs> why is that? Like, do they just suppress the hell out of their genomes when they do that? Or, uh, I mean, as to the difference in animals, I'm not sure how well I can comment. Um, but uh, in plants, I mean, there are a lot of immediate consequences of, of polyploidy in a lot of cases. So some of the things that I mentioned, right, like uh, multisomic inheritance, um, bad pairing of chromosomes at meiosis uh, can, in fact, have deleterious uh, effects on some of these polyploid lineages. Um, gene silencing is a big part of it. Again, allopolyploids tend to be more successful. So I think that, that plants' ability uh, to be so promiscuous and produce so many hybrids is also helpful because those allopolypoids have less problems with chromosome pairing at meiosis. Um, and yeah, I think in ferns, certainly, uh, it's been shown that sort of the immediate silencing of a lot of genes uh, is very important to polyploids immediately following that whole genome duplication. Great, thank you. Yes. Fantastic talk, really interesting multidisciplinary approach. Um, so. In the tree ferns, in the Alsophila, so you found high syntony, mm -hmm. uh, but low syntony in two other homosphorus ferns. Yes. Do you think one explanation could be the life history, the fact that these are long-lived? Definitely. I mean, and, that's, and that is something that we suggest in the paper. So the original study that used chloroplast data uh, and found those reduced substitution rates in Cyathiales suggested uh, that it was linked not only to generation time, but to arborescence per se. Um, and there have been other studies in angiosperms that find that substitution rate is correlated to things like plant height. Uh, 
I mean, not just to the generation time of, of these plants. Uh, so I definitely think that, that life history is at play, certainly in the substitution rates. And again, while I don't think there's necessarily a direct link between them, also possibly uh, in the centony being preserved over time. Uh, related to that question, it got me thinking about the same thing of uh, the old fashioned idea of adaptive gene complexes. Like, why are these genes hanging together versus not? Because in a lot of cases, right, uh, hybridization, for example, breaks apart adaptive complexes. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering in these arborescent uh, ferns, what's different about being sort of quote woody, right, being like a tree versus being a more herbaceous type fern? So, uh, yeah, I mean, and it's possible it has something to do with it. I, I don't know enough about the difference in, in gene expression between, say, the woody ferns versus the more herbaceous ones. That being said, um, we did see, we did analyze gene expression uh, in Alsophila spinulosa. And one of the things that was interesting is we didn't necessarily, when we saw genes that were located on two different chromosomes, we didn't necessarily see any kind of bias. Uh, which I think is unusual in polyploids. I think typically in polyploids, both ancient and recent, uh, you do see a, a bias very early on uh, that then sort of persists between genes that are either along the same chromosome or originate from the same genome. Uh, and, and we don't see that in Alsophila, which is unusual. Yeah. It was a question, of course. Oof. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, how did you calibrate your trees to get 400 million years, 200 million years? So those calibrations actually uh, are secondary calibrations uh, that we took from a paper uh, by West Testo et al. Um, and to be fair, most of their calibrations were much deeper in the tree. They had very few calibrations that were actually in uh, the Lycopodiaceae. Um, but it's by far the most fossil calibrations that have been used in a lycophyte tree. Uh, and, and they were able to calibrate the crown age of lycophytes um, and, and also I think the crown age of lycopodiaceae, uh, just not within that group very much. Um, it's definitely debatable. Uh, other papers have gotten much younger estimates for that, but most of them had, had much lower sampling of lycophytes um, and weren't really focused on lycophyte diversification per se. The nice thing about the Testo paper uh, is it has really good species sampling and they tried a lot of different clock approaches uh, using a variety of different phylogenetic methods uh, to kind of try to settle on that date. But I, I agree it's controversial um, that they're quite that old. Um, let's see if I got this right. Um, so wasn't the full genome, which is really awesome. Um, so for the Lycopodiaceae, you have very, very low rates of chromosome rearrangement mm -hmm. in your compared genomes. And then you touched on substitution rates, but I didn't quite pick up on that. Is that also low or is it kind of comparable to like a Lagenella comparative genomic? Uh, no, so it's, it's low compared. So we did it compared to all of the heterosporous lycophytes together. We compared substitution rates. And compared to all of them together, it's, it's much lower. And then even when we compare independently to either Selaginella or to Isoedes, uh, the Lycopodiaceae are consider have considerably lower substitution rates. Um, though, the same paper uh, by Testo et al. looked at substitution rates, and it does vary a fair amount within the Lycopodiaceae. Um, you might have noticed that in that tree, there were a couple branches that were a lot longer than the others in the Lycopodiaceae. Uh, and I, I think that's evidence of the fact there are a couple of groups within Lycopodiaceae that do seem to have accelerated rates of substitution relative to the others. But as a whole, they seem much lower. And it would be really interesting to look at the genomes in those plates. Yeah. yeah. Forgive me if it, if it was like said and I missed it. I thank you also for a wonderful, what, what a wonderful thought. Um, and congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, okay, my question, I'm sorry it's so basic, but I don't understand the basis for the hypothesis that a homosphorus uh, fern would, ha would be expected to have a larger, uh, well, yeah, would be, be expected to have a larger genome than a heterosporous. I just don't understand the- So, I mean, as to why they would be expected to, there are a few different theories. Um, that have to do with things like intergametophytic selfing, right? That maybe they're keeping a lot more chromosomes around, a lot more chromosomal material around. Um, 
because intergamete hepatic selfing is going to render a lot of sites homozygous, you're going to end up with more sort of recessive lethal problems. Uh, and maybe just by keeping more chromosomes around, right, they're staving that off. Um, but I, I think that this is sort of something that's been revisited a few times uh, as to why exactly they'd be doing it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is they just have really large chromosomes. I mean, everywhere you look across homosporous plants, uh, again, the their genomes are three to four times the size of heterosporous. Uh, I think the why is a little more complicated, uh, and I don't have a great answer for it. All right, that's my almost Dr. Wheel. <laughs> this has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.